and welcome to The Family of Things, an Irish podcast of ideas, life and how we live it. I'm Helen Shaw and in this series I get to talk with people living life with passion and ambition. And today my guest is writer and performer and as he says himself, accidental activist Rory O'Neill. But perhaps Rory is better known to most of us by his alter ego, Panty Bliss. The wonderful creation, as he says, the giant cartoon woman that he creates so Rory, Panty today is somewhere in your cupboard and you're here in full-blown Rory O'Neill. I mean, do you sometimes have a sense where, where you have to think about that, about whether you're Rory O'Neill or Panty Bliss? Well, it's always one of those funny things. You know, the gay community is super comfortable with drags and being in and out of drag or whatever. They get it because they've been exposed to it for so long. And I think sometimes people outside of the gay community sometimes have trouble with it and they worry about how they're going to call me or have they offended me by calling me the wrong thing and all of that. I think they're also worried that, you know, that I might be transgender or something and that's why they get a little uptight about it. Whereas the kind of drag that I do or the drag tradition that I come out of, which is sort of rooted in the gay community, the drag queen is sort of living in the real world She's getting taxis and she's hanging out in a bar and people get to know her. The regular customers know her well. And, you know, and they want to have real conversations with you. So it's not a fully created fake character living in a fake world, you know, like maybe say something like Dame Maiden Everidge is. So you can't talk to Dame Maiden Everidge about real things in Barry Humphrey's life because that sort of ruins the whole thing. Whereas that's not true of the kind of drag tradition that I come out of. The line is super blurred between the performer and the performance. Because if I'm, you know, in a nightclub and hanging out with a friend, they want to have a real conversation, not a fake conversation. You know what I mean? So to me, Panty is just sort of, she's another version of me, but she is still me. So I don't waste a single thought about it. You know, so let's say take a regular actor. You know, obviously the Kate Blanchett who's sitting up at the table at some sort of press conference isn't the same Kate Blanchett who was getting up in the morning and making coffee and being grumpy. She's playing a version of herself, and that's what a drag queen from the tradition that I come from is doing. So I don't have any cares about that, but other people sometimes stumble about that. And the, the political correctness of he, she, or what we go with. So you say you know, Panty's a facet of your persona, and it sits perfectly in tune with everything else. I mean, w- one of the things, just her Twitter account, or your Twitter account, pub landlady, performer, writer, speechifier, gender discombobulatist, national fucking treasure, and author of the book, Woman in the Making. She also has the doctor as the honorary doctor, it goes with Dr. Panty Bliss. So there's this total merging of all your bits. It is, but it is still slightly curated. Like there are things that I would not say on Panty's Twitter because it wouldn't sit right with the sort of public panty that, you know, things that I would say on my Rory's private Facebook page. You know what I mean? Like the sort of hang-ups that other people about what to call me. I don't care if you call me sitting here today in a jumper and jeans, you know, panty. It, it makes no difference to me. And my friends will often refer to me as panty and, or, or she because, because we're just over it. We don't care. But I really don't like it when I have spent two hours getting ready and I've created the whole illusion and, you know, I'm looking, you know, like panty. And then somebody shouts Gorgeous. across the, the road, oh, hey, Rory. I mean, no, I, you know, you're, you're pricking the bubble there somehow. Exactly. But, but in the other way around, I don't care. You know? I just were on that because I suppose it does fascinate us, particularly... I think women, because I've been told it takes you two hours to become panty. Take me through how you go through the process, because it's quite an ordeal to become as gorgeous as she is. (laughs) Well, that all depends on the lighting. Um, (laughs) I can do it in an hour and a half, you know, not including the sort of the prep, whatever, the shaving and all that. But from when I sit down at the mirror, I like to have two hours because then I don't, you know, have to sort of panic about anything. It's a weird thing, because obviously I've done that thousands of times, many thousands of times. And sometimes when I first sit down at the mirror, especially, you know, depending on your mood of the day, I kind of sort of think, oh, because I'm going to be sitting here for the next two hours, you know, essentially alone, usually, just looking in the mirror and doing the same thing that I have done so many thousands of times. And when I first sit down, I'm like, oh, that's going to be work. But then there's this weird thing where it becomes sort of zen-like. It's just something that you've done so often and you just sort of fall into it. And then the next thing you know, you're looking at your watch thinking, oh God, I better finish up, you know. Yeah. And it takes that long because, you know, unlike you or any other, you know, girl, 
I'm not sort of just highlighting a few little things and, you know, whatever, and covering a blemish or whatever. Like, I'm sort of trying to wipe out everything. You know, the base part of my makeup is the longest part. And then I am building a totally new face on top of that, really. Like, it's a special effects job. And then, of course, whatever, wigs and padding and all sorts of things as well. Because in a sense, you are a tall, athletic guy, a man. And in some ways, when we look at Panty, she has this tiny little waist as a visual, perhaps, illusion within it. You're yeah. going like, what the hell? But I suppose it's that thing where you create the, this padding around it. That it yeah, it's totally built. illusion. You know, obviously, I have the waist that I have. Now, I do usually coarse it and everything so I can make it a bit smaller. <laughs> But it, it's totally illusion because I am sort of cinching my waist or whatever. But then I'm also padding out the hips and all of that, you know. The upper bits. Yeah, so it works really well in a photograph. But that's also why people are sometimes sort of shocked when they meet me for the first time in, in three dimensions and they realize how big Panty is, you know, because you don't get that from a photograph. So that's all just part of it. But that's also the fun of it, you know. I mean, I still, after all these years, I may sit down at the mirror and sort of think, oh, God, I'm going to be here for the next two hours and whatever. But at the same time, I still enjoy that, you know, the creative aspect of it. I enjoy the working out what she's going to look like today and, and then sort of building that. Because I think one of the recent highlights, which also brought home that visual impact of Panty Bliss, was your appearance on the stage with Bono and you too. Oh. It just looked great fun. It was great fun, yeah. They called me up a few days beforehand and said, you know, would you be into doing this? And I was like... Sure, that sounds like, you know, laugh. And, you know, I went there on the day and obviously it's a massive, you know, arena show and it's Huge YouTube, rig. whatever, yeah. So, you know, the staging is really incredible. I went there that afternoon and we did like a couple of rehearsals of it and they take it very seriously. You know, you don't get to be you two with, you know, doing anything slapdash. So they all were there for the little rehearsal. But um, the tour manager guy, he, so he sees the rehearsal and in the rehearsal, of course, I'm just Rory. And I'm just walking around the stage in a pair of boots and a jacket, you know. And then the tour manager guy later comes up to the dressing room. And by that stage, I'm in drag. And so he suddenly he sees what Panty I look like appearing. now. Yeah. So then after we did the whole thing, he goes, oh, my God, he's like going on about it. And I said, but you saw me before we, I went on. He's like, yes, but I didn't know you were going to be going full on, you know, hippie chick. You know, because <laughs> I think so many people have this very specific idea of what a drag queen is. So I think he expected me to come out in a sequined ball gown. So, um, you know, I quite like upending people's expectations. You know. Surprising them. Yeah. And challenge that. And Bono really played with it. He did, yeah. He was very on board about it. It was fun of him. He was very flirty. He was, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it was a performance. <laughs> trailblazing on marriage equality in the country, and now the country is trailblazing on marriage equality in the world. Congratulations. And I suppose it brings you back to it in your book, Woman in the Making. We get that idea of the journey from your roots at home to where you are now and, and becoming the Panty Bliss performer. But I suppose one of the things that struck me was maybe the influences in your life that mm. shaped it. I always think when I, I look at Panty and particularly maybe when you see the hair and the frosted eye makeup, there's a lot of Farrah Fawcett going on with oh, the, Charlie the Angels. Yeah, oh, absolutely. And that's the other thing about the kind of drag. I, you know, the Panty grows along with you, you know. And certainly when we were younger, Farrah Fawcett was a massive visual influence. And the hair and all that yeah. flick back curls. There is that sense that she has that connection yeah. with her but it also, you talk about an aunt, and I'm yes. going to ask you to read a little bit from your memoir with it, but, mm -hmm. but your aunt perhaps used to blow in and out of your lives at home. And tell us a little about that, about where you grew up and who she was. Well, so I was growing up in the 70s in a small town in the west of Ireland. And, you know, 1970s, pre-internet and all of that, and we had only had, you know, two TV channels. So you, d you definitely felt like, you know, the, the rest of the world was somewhere far away. Like I remember, you know, you'd always, when my parents would announce that we were going to have to go to Dublin, you know, to visit granny or something. You know, even that journey, the whatever, four or five hours it used to take then, that just seemed like a, a lifetime to me, you know, that, the you know, journey. The roads were terrible. Yes. <laughs> and so when things came from abroad and ended up in our little town, it seemed very glamorous and, and exciting exotic. to me. Yes, yeah, super exotic. 
But so we, I had this aunt and, you know, and she was very glamorous and she was gorgeous, you know, and she married a man 25 years, her senior. And, you know, seemingly to me at the time, you know, super sort of glamorous life. And she lived in America and she would come and she always had these incredible sort of presents for us that, you, you know, that, get yeah, that you'd never, <laughs> we'd never seen before. You know, like a hoodie is the classic example. And it's funny, I recently met one of my cousins and we were talking about it and I didn't realize that she didn't just bring us hoodies. She also brought hoodies to the cousins. She was and they them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because they were bright yellow and they had um, oh, an American football team logo on it. So not only was it a, a jumper with, that had a hood on it, it was also bright yellow and it had a big logo. College. Just stuff that we didn't have at the time. Just talking to my cousin about it, they had the same thing. And he thought he was the coolest person in his. He lived in a small town in Monaghan and he grew out of it eventually. And he was really disappointed that he'd grown, grown out of this thing that made him the coolest kid in town. And one day he goes home and his mother, my aunt, sort of says to him, now granny has just done something very nice for you. And when she shows you what she's done for you, you have to act appreciative and tell her it's lovely. And that is all you're to say. And he goes in and his granny had knitted onto the end of the sleeves of the yellow hoodie, like another few inches. So it would still oh, fit him. Last. I, I know. So ridiculous, but so sweet of her or whatever. <laughs> so he had to pretend that that was fabulous. <laughs> Brilliant. So, Rory, I'm going to ask you, if you don't mind, just to give us a sample, because Woman in the Making, which is your story and your memoir, I think it's beautifully written and, and for everyone who can remember some of these periods and have gone through it. But I was very captured also by this story of your aunt. So maybe just read a little bit from your own words. Yes, I'll do my best. Um, <clears throat> but Glamour came to our house once every few years in the shape of Auntie Cuey, my mother's younger sister. She even had a glamorous name, Columba, which everyone shortened to Q or Cuey for some reason. Auntie Cuey. She was gorgeous. She had this rich, husky voice redolent of Catherine Hepburn's. She had wanted to be an actress and did a bit on radio, but mostly she was just beautiful. Seven different men proposed to her, and in fact, my mother met my father when he came to the house to take Auntie Cuey out. But Auntie Cuey said no to all of her suitors until a wealthy American, an ex-naval officer, proposed. He was 25 years her senior, but he was dashing and exciting. And in grey 1950s Ireland, he was in technicolour. And he took her to America. In 1970s Ireland, America still retained a sense of real glamour. It was this faraway exotic place we'd probably never see, where Mary Tyler Moore and Charlie's Angels lived with giant refrigerators and bouncing hair. Auntie Cuey would arrive home with her husky drawl in a swirl of beige pantsuits and menthol cigarettes. Cigarettes with mint in them. And the glamour would almost knock me over. She'd smoke and drawl and sing, I'm a woman. And her bracelets would clank as she'd take out gifts wrapped like they were in American movies with shiny paper and glittery bows. And inside we'd discover new and amazing things. Pez dispensers, magic tricks, a jumper with a hood on it. America had everything. We'd never seen the like. The whole town was talking about us and our jumpers with the hoods on them. All the other kids wanted to have an Auntie Cuey. I wanted to be Auntie Cuey. She was like no one else I had ever met. She was exotic and glamorous and different. She was like a character from a movie, a 3D emissary from a 2D world that I'd only ever seen on screen or in books. But she was flesh and blood, undeniable, tangible evidence of a big world out there, somewhere past Roscommon. I feverishly imagined this other world and fevered to be part of it, this bigger, brighter world full of new and different things, exciting and full of possibilities, where people wore jumpers with hoods on them. Fantastic. I love Antiquity, and I suppose I have to ask, is she still with us? She is, yes. And does she know the influence? She's obviously read the book. I actually don't know if she's read the book, but she's definitely, it's sort of been a going joke in our family, the influence of Antiquity on Panty for quite a few years, so she definitely knows about that, yeah. Now, obviously, in writing the book, it paralleled with the whole experience around the campaign on marriage referendum. But for you writing it and that journey through your own life, what was that like? Just the experience of putting your story down. People ask me that a lot, but actually it wasn't the, but it was such a big deal for me because my live theatre shows are very rooted in my real experience as well. So I'm quite used to delving into my own stories to try and 
well, as I pompously say, illuminate a larger truth. So that part of it wasn't such a big deal to me. People sometimes ask me about things that I don't have in the book. A lot of people say, well, you know, you never mentioned boyfriends or anything like that. But that's partly because I don't really feel that, the, you know, my various boyfriends had much of a huge influence in some ways. But it's also because it's not a biography. You know, I don't think that that part is of interest to other people. Or I didn't think so. <laughs> but people are nosy. <laughs> Yeah, because in some ways the story is also a story about Irish society and how it's changing and all of us can recognise the place you're describing, which yeah. you just articulated in, in terms of where you were in Balnaro. But in parallel with the film, the documentary film that Conor Horgan has made, The Queen mm. of Ireland, it's interesting to see them both together in a sense. And maybe the film is far more dominated by the marriage referendum. Yeah. Was that a different experience? Because that was much more somebody... Stalking you. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a totally different experience, partly because the, the film is Connor's version of my story in a way. And so that's just an interesting thing to see how somebody else sees you. And also, Connor is telling one very specific story. So, I mean, Connor's film is even further from a biography in the sense because he's only interested in one particular thread. The book was written very quickly. I had to do it in a very concentrated, short period of time. So it was very intense. And I was writing it in the back of the tour bus or on a train or a plane or whatever, and then going down to, to Anna McCarrick, the retreat, and piling in for a week. With all those very serious writers hanging out there. Yes, yeah. <laughs> so it was very concentrated, whereas Connor's film, he was filming for five years. I had known Connor for many years. He had photographed Panty many times. He was a very successful commercial and fashion photographer. So I knew him and I trusted him and I liked him. Also, Connor's a straight guy, but he very much gets the gays. You know, his oldest and best friend was one of the gay superstars on the Dublin gay scene. I, I felt like I could trust Connor and I knew it'd look good because of his fashion and photography background. But when Connor asked me, you know, I was still somewhat reluctant because it's a it's a thing to, you know. To let someone in. Yeah, in that way. But A, I knew him and B, what he was asking me to do and what I was agreeing to at the time was this really small little character documentary or something that I thought would, you know, I don't know who would ever see it. But then, of course, a lot happened in the years that he was filming. And so the whole thing just became bigger and bigger as it went along. As and, in a and, sense, your profile became bigger yes, and bigger. Yeah. And it was actually Connor who filmed the Noble Call speech in the Abbey. You know, he's great. He just thought, oh, maybe that'll be good for my little documentary. You know, and then so much came from that. So the project turned out to be just something much bigger than we had ever anticipated when we started. And so in a weird way, the book to me is a very sort of closed off little thing, you know, that I did in a very intense short period of time. Whereas the film is very different because it's sort of been in my life much longer. And because it's Connor's project and there's so many other people involved in the project, the producers and the, everybody else, it's just, it's a very different experience. It's just kind of this thing that's rolling on without me. And every now and then I, I, I sort of jump on for a minute. Well, I always think of Rory. He w dressed up in a tutu belonging to one of the girls who was doing ballet, but wearing Wellington boots underneath it, and he's lapping around the sitting room in there, you know, that kind of thing. You've heard it said, I'm sure, very many times that your parents become the real stars of Queen of Ireland, of yeah. the film. And I guess my favourite moment in it is right towards the end when you go back home mm -hmm. to Balnrobe and you're with your mum and dad and they're kind of ordinarily in their greys or nondescript uh, normal street clothes. Yeah. And then they're walking down the street with an umbrella with you in the middle. <laughs> there you are. Far to go. <laughs> it's just so moving when you go into that community meeting and the warmth there mm. uh, around it and your folks just come across as that unusual Irish mix of being both religious and terribly open. Yeah. Your dad was a vet. Yes, I grew up you know, as a vet son in a small country town, you know, and you know, that sort of separated you out a little bit from the rest of the town. You know, it was always the, the doctor, the vet, the priest and the bank manager, you know, that's what, you know, they were, they sort of existed on a separate... Kind of a middle like, class... Yeah stepping order within any small town. Yeah, yeah. But no, I, you're right. I think my parents are the real stars of the documentary. And I am very aware of how lucky I am to have them as parents. And I've become more aware of that since 
the film because I've gotten so many letters and emails and stuff about my parents and people loving my parents and people wishing that they had parents like my parents, rather sad stories. And people have written to my parents, which is really amazing. Ah. People are, literally have written to Panty's parents. That's what they put on this thing. <laughs> Ballon Robe, County Mayo. And it gets to them. And they've written really lovely things to them. And they're really enjoying this. I think they are. See, I think they would probably not really admit that because they're quite old school. You know, they wouldn't want to be drawing any attention to themselves. But I think they have enjoyed it because people have been good to them about it. And, you know, afterwards. And, and you know, and even now when they, you know, are in the town... As my mother sort of said the other day, she now knows all the other people around the town who have gay children that the rest of the town doesn't know because these people have come up and approached my parents and and said, well, you know, my whoever is also gay or lesbian or whatever. So I think it's given them a sort of um, experience or a sort of view. Because there's that wonderful moment with your dad in the film when he's talking about not just knowing about and coming to terms with you being gay, but when you had to tell them about being HIV positive. Mm. And your dad has that wonderful line that there's a frame of the sacred heart and he put his trust in the sacred heart that something good would happen for you. Mm. And he kind of wells up a little bit. He does, yeah. There's a sense in which I think that's why it's so moving, because that is Ireland at its best. Well, it's funny about my dad, because um, when I came out to them as being gay, and my dad is of his generation, he is 81, and, you know, essentially from small town Ireland. But when I came out, he didn't bat an eyelid, not from the first second. He just had no problem with it. And my mother was kind of upset when I first told him. And I, for years, assumed that he wasn't that cool about it, but he had just decided it would be good for for my mother, you know, if he acted super cool and, you know, because she's a little upset and so... But I've since found out that, no, it didn't bother him. I mean, there's a sense in which it is very unusual. And I think in Ireland there was that sense that with 2015, we've kind of hopefully purged something. I think so. And I actually think that as difficult and frustrating and everything as the whole discussion before the referendum was I think that there was a sense of that you know we we discussed it endlessly for six months coming up to the marriage referendum and some horrible things were said in public (laughs) and it was quite difficult at times but once the referendum was over I feel like there was a sense that all that had been purged of course there are still people who are going to have a horrible problem with gay people or whatever but there's a sense that as as a society All the worst things were said, everything was thrown into the mix and that now we're all over that. It's done. And uh, there's a sense of, uh, well, a sort of a renewed sense of optimism, I think. And in many ways, what happened in 2015, I tried to explain this to somebody outside of Ireland who saw it solely about marriage and gay rights. And I said, yeah, It was about that, but it was about much more. And Mm. in some ways, the momentum that came up, it was about what kind of Ireland do you want? What does it mean to be Irish? Who are we? And it's a bit like your dad saying he asked the Sacred Heart to look after you. Is that, can we accommodate the other? Yeah, no, I feel that very strongly. I mean, on the surface, obviously, it was about marriage equality. But I think part of that, or bigger than that almost, was a sense of, are gay people full and equal members of society or not? That that was really the question. And from that then, so many other questions came up about other aspects of... Belonging. Yes, exactly. And in a sense, to me, it was actually about Irishness. We were deciding who can we include under the umbrella of Irishness. And there was a feeling before that that maybe we weren't including or couldn't include LGBT people. And I kind of felt that being gay here, that people were then, ah, yeah, well, they're a bit foreign. And they're not really Irish. Irish, You know, yeah. that to be Irish, you ha- you know, there's this kind you of be wearing checklist. the orange jumper. Yeah, or you had to be into GAA, or you had to, you know, love you too, or whatever. That there was a kind of a checklist, you know, for Irishness. For true Irishness. Yes, yeah. and that somehow, you know, wearing glitter and being into wham or whatever excluded you from Irishness. And I felt that that's what the conversation really was kind of about. You you could say, all right, so we had the referendum and now it's over. But actually, I don't think it's over at all. I think that that conversation has inspired questions about equality in so many other areas. For example, the campaign that's happening now. Which is the uh, amendment relating to the pro-life amendment in, in 1983. Well, for example, 
where I think it's really clear the influence it's had, partly just bringing up these questions, but then even the way these questions are now being dealt with. The referendum was fought and won, really, by people telling their personal stories. And people come around and say, well, this is what it was like for me to be growing up LGBT in this country, and this is what happened to me, and this is how I feel about it. And we have, for the first time ever, women have come forward to tell their abortion stories. And that has never really happened before. In all the countless arguments that we've had over abortion and over the last you know, 30 years, women coming forward to tell their personal stories has never been part of it. And I think that is something that they were inspired to do from the referendum. There's also the waking the feminist movement about women in the arts being given the same respect. And I think that would not have taken off either without the referendum. I think that's a movement that was sparked off because of the conversation we'd had over marriage equality. And it's a difficult territory. And in a sense, you can see the challenges within that, that when we start to have that debate about tolerance or accommodation, it's like, where do the lines begin and end? And people will have those margins. And so it's very confusing for people to see this as just being one box and we tick them all. There's mm. a debate that's now happening. And I yeah. think that's kind of what's interesting about it. I mean, that's absolutely true. I think it's healthy for us. We need to have these discussions. We need to argue them all out. And I think it's been a great after effect of the referendum. back to Rory O'Neill and in a sense this unpacking of what's happened since then and particularly I guess since that incredible takeoff of the Abbey Theatre and the Nobel Call. I mean from watching the film and obviously you know it's, it's there within the book as well you didn't really have any idea that that was going to become the viral moment Hello. that it did. My name is Panty and then um, for the benefit of the visually impaired or the incredibly naive I am a drag queen. I, I just thought I was giving another speech. I had absolutely no expectations of it. Obviously, I was personally annoyed at the time, um, the situation I was in, so that explains why I was making a relatively passionate speech. But I absolutely had no expectations of it. I honestly thought the only people who would ever hear it were the people who were in the auditorium that night. I never, never entered my head that anybody else would care or bother watching it. Have any of you ever come home in the evening and turned on the television and there is a panel of people, you know, nice people, respectable people, smart people, the kind of people who probably make good neighborly neighbors, the kind of people who write for newspapers, and they're all sitting around and they are having a reasoned debate on the television, a reasoned debate about you about what kind of person you are, about whether or not you're capable of being a good parent, about whether you want to destroy marriage, about whether or not you're safe around children, about you know, whether or not God herself thinks you're an abomination, about whether, in fact, maybe you are intrinsically disordered. And even the nice TV presenter lady that you feel is like almost a friend because you see her being nice on TV all the time, even she thinks it's perfectly okay that they're all having this reasoned debate about you and about who you are and about what rights you deserve or don't deserve. And that feels oppressive. And in some ways, I think, as you say, the personal stories in the marriage referendum were decisive and the way in which it mobilised the 25-year-olds mm. of this generation mm. as a moment of activism. Yeah. But I particularly thought that the amount of sharing around your piece at the Abbey in mainstream, ordinary Ireland, mm. it began this conversation that this referendum was about more than gay rights. Mm. It was about all of us. And that began a conversation which extended what could have been a much narrower yeah. discussion. Well, I'd like to tell you that, oh, yes, I knew that was going to happen and I had all that plan. No, I was just basically describing my experience. But what sort of astounded me afterwards was how everybody related to it in their own way. I guess because everybody at some point feels different or, you know, oppressed excluded. in some way or excluded. And I, I mean, still to this day, it's the power of the internet, but certainly in the first year afterwards, I would just get this onslaught of emails and cards and letters from people writing to me about it and sort of telling me their stories. And yes, of course, there was gay people writing to me, but they weren't the majority. I mean, I was getting letters from people in wheelchairs, fat kids in school or whatever, women, lots of women, of course, people with autism. That was the one that struck me a lot. Just people who identified with what I had to say 
not necessarily because they were LGBT, but for their own circumstances. And that totally took me by surprise. You know, I thought I was telling my annoyance. I didn't realize, you know, that my annoyance was everybody's But annoyance. a lot of us were annoyed. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, that's great. And I actually think it's really heartening to hear that so much of that connected with disability, both physical mm. and psychological or mental, because that also seems maybe the territory that we really haven't grappled with. You yeah. know, that disability remains the bit outside the current discussions. Yeah, absolutely. I think in some ways people with disability identified it identify strongly because when people with disability are out and about in public, they're immediately identified as such. And people make judgments, yes, which is they, what they you, were, you were getting yes. at in terms of the concept of yeah. homophobia is that we start to put people into boxes or yeah. categories immediately and yeah. make these calls on them. Yes, exactly. That people form an opinion just by looking, you know, looking at, at you. you. And so I think perhaps that's why people with, you know, physical disability anyway identified so strongly with it. And I'm curious, in a sense, how much that changed you, because you went from what was your own journey to suddenly becoming, as you say, in Panty Bliss's Twitter account, the national fucking treasure. <laughs> yeah. Really, whether you want it or not, that you become this icon and, as you say, accidental activist, mm. being the vehicle for change for mm. other people and for other causes way beyond gay rights. Yes, it, it's certainly an odd position to end up in, especially when you've come from where I've come from. You know, I'm a drag queen entertainer. I think it's probably unique. I mean, I can't think of another country in the world, you know, that gets a drag queen to open a science fair or, you know, whatever. You know what I mean? There is this thing now where panties become very establishment. In, in this, yeah. Do you worry about that? I do. Uh, you know, I do. She was never establishment. No, she was never meant to be establishment either. You know, the whole reason I got into drag was because it's sort of transgressive and bold and crossing boundaries and underground and all that kind of stuff. And now, you know, Panty's doing the speech on Christmas Day on TV and opening Queen science of fairs and, you know, all that stuff. And it's something I've had to sort of work out as I go along because can you still be a transgressive, discombobulating performer and be getting an honorary doctor from Trinity. It's a funny thing. And I'm not entirely sure. I, I sort of work it out as I go along. But but you're right that suddenly, through this sort of series of accidents, I became this sort of figurehead in a way for change or, you know, whatever. You're and that's symbol. also Yes. Part of that, that reason, I think, is in some weird way, it was easy to make Panty into sort of an avatar because she isn't a real person. And so you, you can sort of project onto her and Lots you can sort of, of sanctify values. her. Yeah. yeah. Whereas you can't really do that to Rory so much because Rory has ex-boyfriends who are annoyed with him or whatever, you know. And that's an unexpected position for me to have ended up in. And it's also a kind of responsibility. That's also something I've had to sort of work out as I've been going along. I don't want to censor myself because I am who I am and I'm somewhat tongue-in-cheek you know, like performer. A and, yeah, all of that. <laughs> But then I'm also aware of the weight that people give everything I say now. People take everything I say so seriously. And so I have to just be a little careful sometimes. But the sort of compromise that I've made is I tend to be more considered in very public forums, like online or if I'm speaking to a journalist or whatever. But in my live shows, I kind of figure you have paid your money. You know, you decided to come along here and we're, and we're having a live interaction and it's different. They can get more of the nuance. And so in my live shows, I'll be my old self, which, yes, is always trying to deliver you a message. But it's wrapped up also in a bit of outrageous fun. And so I figured the people who are coming to my live shows That's are what game. they want. Yeah. Do you have a sense about now this zeitgeist, this mm -hmm. moment that you're in as Panty Bliss mm -hmm. and how you use it and what you do with it? Because maybe it will and maybe it won't last. Well, I feel I'm in a, a sort of lucky position when it comes to that. I had been trundling along doing my thing for 25 years or whatever before it sort of exponentially exploded. And I had been doing perfectly fine for those 25 years. I've always been able to pay my rent, have my bar. It all trundled along and I was comfortable and happy. And I was doing my theatre shows and travelling around in a sort of a dedicated small fan base around the world. And, and then this whole thing sort of happened. But if it all goes back tomorrow, I'm perfectly fine with that because I was happy before all of this happened. And of course, within the small gay community, everybody knew me already, you know. So I feel in that sense, I'm lucky. I, I really don't care. Obviously, it's an opportunity and you can do things on a bigger scale and, and that's all great. 
but I'm not lying there awake and worrying that you know, it'll all be over tomorrow. But I guess in the moment that you are in, what would you like to do with it? You get a sense from reading your book that at heart you're an artist, you know, mm. that you write, you perform. What do you wish to do in the next phase? I mean, what are the dreams and aspirations of Rory? Well, in some ways they haven't changed. You know, my first love is the live performances and the theatre shows, and I'm just continuing to do those. But I have always wanted to transfer ideas. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to transfer my view of the world to the audience. And that is still what I want to do. The odd position I find myself in now, though, is, you know, that I have the sort of specific interests that I have. So obviously, I've thought very much about what it means to be LGBT, about gender, about women. These are my sort of specific interests. But now because of the way here, especially in Ireland, that I'm sort of seen as this avatar for change or equality or whatever, people are always now wanting me to help them out with their other things. And I find that difficult. Campaigns. I find that difficult because obviously I'd like to help everybody. But at the same time, I don't want to just become this boring person who's constantly giving out to people about various campaigns and all that. So it becomes very awkward. Like if I wanted my my, my Twitter stream could just be a constant flow of retweets about various causes. And and, and I feel that is a stress because I feel people then... Everybody wants something from you. Yes, and I think people then feel like, you know, if I don't, they get upset with me. And Panty's not being nice. Yeah. And also, I don't feel qualified to campaign on lots of issues because they're not my area of expertise. So, yeah, that's a funny one. There's a lot of expectation. Yeah. Yeah. And books, given the memoir, do you have a sense that you're going to write more, that you want to write more? Well, I didn't particularly enjoy writing the book because it was so... (laughs) It had to be all done so fast. It was very stressed, sort of. And I am literally the world's worst procrastinator. You know, I will sit for days on end knowing I should have started something. And so I'm not the kind of person who's ever going to be getting up at 6 a.m. every morning and very diligently writing for two hours and then having your break and all that. My first love is the live shows. And so I am continuing to work on those and write those and that sort of thing. Would I like to write another book sometime? Yes, I think I would at some point. But I don't know what that is yet. And I'm not rushing into it because I also know it'll be a hair pulling exercise. (laughs) And Rory, I guess we're talking about a year in which you've gone from incredible extremes and highs. And we've talked about dancing and flirting with Bono to last May in 2015. The results on that incredible day of the results in the marriage referendum. Highs and lows for you. Because there was that sense, which is in the film, where you're asked by a reporter, a very po-faced reporter, is this the happiest day of your life? <laughs> yeah. But for you, what would you pick out as you look back and as you think about what's happened? Well, May 23rd, the day of the referendum result, was an incredible day on so many levels. And to be in Dublin city centre that day, and even the weather was just so incredible that day. And I will always remember that day as being just one of the high points of my life. So spectacular. It's funny, though, when I also look back on it and I think about things like that. You know, everyone, I think, almost expects me to run out and get married or something. But the reason I was attracted first to the gay scene, to the sort of nightclub scene, to drag, is because it is discombobulating and transgressive and underground. And the reason I found it so exciting was that there was a sense that back then that gay people could recreate a whole other world of their own design. And that we were free from the sort of sometimes oppressive, sometimes boring expectations. You know, the kind of things that my brothers and sisters had to, you know, get married, move to the suburbs, get a good job, have raise kids. kids, all that stuff. And I found it incredibly liberating and exciting that we didn't have to bother with any of that. And so I have all the way along had this worry about the marriage equality movement that then gay people are going to have these same pressures. And I don't want that to be the case. So I saw it always purely from an equality issue. Lots of gay people wanted to do that. Lots of my great friends want to get married. And so they should have that option. They should have exactly the same choices and options available to them as everybody else. So for me, it was purely that issue, which is then odd that I sort of became this sort of avatar for marriage because I'm not advocating it for everybody. I think if you want to go and live with three, you know, other ladies <laughs> on a farm <laughs> somewhere, you know, go for it. So yes, May 23rd was an incredible day, but it is a little amusing to me too. Rory O'Neill, aka Panty Bliss, thank you very much for sharing your journey and your time with us. And if anybody hasn't read Rory's memoir, Woman in the Making, please do. It's a great read. 
and do try and catch Conor Horgan's film as well, Queen of Ireland. Rory, thanks very much. Thank you.